Well, good every, evening, everyone. Uh, my name's Matt, for those of you who don't know me. Most people do. Um, can I have the PowerPoint up on the screen? Ah, oh, there we go. Perfect. Okay. So, welcome to our new series, Little Books, Big God. Now, as Chris said, we're going to be spending three weeks in this series, then we're having a break for two weeks for the stewardship campaign, and then we'll do the final two weeks of this five-week series, and that will lead us directly into state youth games. So like I said, little books, big God. Okay, now my idea for this series came from my study of the Bible. As we know, there's 66 books in the Bible. There's 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. If you want a good way to remember that, how many letters are there in Old and Testament? So three in Old and nine in Testament, three and nine, 27, oh, Yes, yeah, three and nine, so 39 for the Old Testament, and then multiplied them together to get the New Testament. That's not the key point for tonight. <laughs> the reason that I wanted to do this series is I really wanted to study through all the books of the Bible. And there's, like I said, there's 66 of them, and I really wanted to tick off some pretty early. So I'm like, okay, well, what are the short ones? And so I found the five shortest books in the Bible, and I'm like, these are only one chapter each. Like, I look like I'm flying through the Bible if I've done five books already. Now, part of the problem with my study in it, though, was that I realized I really hadn't heard many people talk on these books before. Like, I don't know about you guys, but these books aren't very frequently spoken on. And so I thought that, well, I'll change that. I want to speak on these books because I love the Bible and I love learning new things about the Bible. And I've learned heaps in my study over these few weeks, which I'm looking forward to sharing with you. Now, if you guys have always wanted to read through a book of the Bible and you've never got around to it, if you stick with us for five weeks, you too will be five books through the Bible as well. So join us for those five weeks. And if you have um, read your Bible a lot, if you do get into it quite a bit, like a lot of you guys I know do, then like I said, these are the more obscure books, the ones that aren't, aren't spoken on often. Um, as we pointed out last week and this morning, Ian, the minister here who's retiring at the end of this year, has never spoken on the book that I'm doing next week. So he's coming along to learn something as well. So tonight we're starting with a letter and it's found in the New Testament and it's a letter to a guy called Philemon. Okay? There is some controversy around his name. Some people call him um, Philemon. That sounds Jamaican to me. So I'm going to stick with Philemon. Okay? And that's what we're going to go with. You can argue with it with me about it later. So if you have your Bibles or if you have an app on your phone with a Bible on it, then open it up to Philemon. It's in the New Testament. It's about 10 books from the end. And I'm going to get Sam up to read it for us. Um, actually, no, I'm not. Sit back down, Sam. <laughs> I am going to get Sam up, but not yet. I'm going to pray first. <laughs> All right, so let's pray. Good start, Matthew. Good start. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you that all of your word is useful for us, and I pray that you'll give me the words to say that honor you and that we'll have teachable hearts tonight. In your almighty name, amen. Okay, so I promised that I'd never sing or dance again up the front because our numbers seem to drop whenever I do that, but I do want to read out some song lyrics to you because I think it's a really good way of finding out where culture is at or what people think is to hear what are the popular songs going around. And so you'll probably recognize this song. It was fairly popular. The artist is a bit obscure. Her name's Taylor Swift. And this is the song. Okay. Sure, I'm not singing them. <laughs> okay. Because, baby, now we got bad blood. You know, it used to be mad love. So take a look what you've done. Because, baby, now we got bad blood. Now we've got problems, and I don't think we can solve them. You made a really deep cut. And, baby, now we got bad blood. So what happened? Okay, so if you believe the news, what happened was that Katy Perry stole one of Taylor Swift's backup dancers, and it was terrible. So Taylor wrote this song about how their relationship was going to be permanently soured because of this. Okay? They have now got bad blood, whereas before they were quite close. It used to be mad love. <laughs> and anyway, okay. Taylor gets a bit more... I feel weird calling her Taylor. I don't want to call it Tay-Tay. I get told off for calling it Tay-Tay. Tay-Tay gets more specific in the verses, okay? This is what she says. Did you think we'd be fine? Still got scars on my back from your knife. So don't think it's in the past. These kind of wounds, they last and they last. Now, did you think it all through? All these things will catch up to you. And time can heal, but this won't. So if you're coming my way, just don't. Like, they're pretty full-on lyrics, I reckon. Like, we can joke, but obviously something serious has happened uh, for the parties involved. And has that ever happened to you? 
Like, have you ever done something to someone else that makes you think, well, there's now a rift in our relationship. It's never going to get healed. Okay? We can probably think of times when we're in Taylor's shoes and times when we're in Katy Perry's shoes as well. Now, it's interesting. The first time that I ever heard this song, it was the music video version, and Kendrick Lamar sings with her, and there was one line that just stuck out to me as soon as I heard it. And it's during the bridge when Taylor's talking about how Band-Aids don't fix bullet holes and beautiful poetry like that. And then Kendrick Lamar, he comes up and he says this line, You forgive, you forget, but you never let it go. You forgive, you forget, but you never let it go. And see, what he's saying here is, in your head, you might forgive someone, you might intellectually forgive someone, and you might even push it back, like you might suppress it in your mind. Say you forget about it, but your heart can never let it go. Like, not when someone hurts you like that. And I think that this book tonight, this letter that we're going to read, is going to speak beautifully into this situation. I wish Taylor could hear it. It's going to tell us about who we are, what Jesus has done for us, and how we live in light of these two things. So now I'm going to get Sam up. Yeah. <laughs> hey, okay, we practiced this beforehand, so if he gets names wrong, don't let him get off the hook, okay? Yeah, you're going to use the mic there. Okay, so the words are going to be up on the screen as well. Paul, oh, is that on? Hello. Yeah. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker. <laughs> also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier. And to the church that meets you in your home. That meets in your home. Grace and peace to you, to you from God our Father and, Jesus, and Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers. Because I hear all about your love for his holy people and for your faith in Lord Jesus. I pray that in your partnership with us... In faith, in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for you, the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you, my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is in my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with you so that he could take, so that he could take your place, helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favour you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me ver that you that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one more th and one thing more. Prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. And so do you, and so do Mark, Aris, Aristocras, Demas and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Well done, Sam. Yeah, 8 out of 10. Not bad. <laughs> well done, everyone. You've now gone through an entire book of the Bible, 65 to go. All right, well, what have we got on, going on here? We have this guy called Onesimus, who is a runaway slave from this guy. He's an obviously wealthy man. His name's Philemon. See, he's rich enough to have his big enough house and servants and a church that's meeting in his house. 
And what happened was Onesimus met this guy called Paul. Okay? Paul is the one who's writing this letter, and in classic Paul style, he's currently in prison. And so Paul introduces Onesimus to the Christian faith, but then he discovers that Onesimus has actually got some history that needs to be resolved. So what Paul does is he writes a letter to Philemon, encouraging Philemon to take Onesimus back. Because you can imagine there's some bad blood between Philemon and Onesimus, and Paul wants to resolve this. See, Paul wants Philemon to forgive Onesimus. He wants Philemon to forget or to not count what Onesimus has done against him. And he wants Philemon to let it go, to move forward in love. So in other words, Paul wants Philemon to forgive, to forget, and to properly let it go. Now, C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, makes the point that forgiveness is really easy to talk about until you have to forgive somebody yourself. And I bet if you ask Taylor Swift, I have no doubt that she would say that forgiveness is a great virtue and we should all be more forgiving. But if you put it into practice, then you end up with songs called Bad Blood. And I think that's the case for all of us as well. We all want to be more forgiving, but putting in that into practice can be difficult. So what I want this message to show us tonight is how we can do this, okay? I want to show you that this letter from Paul to Philemon is a great illustration of how the good news or the gospel of Jesus Christ transforms all of our relationships. And this is a letter is a great picture of the gospel being really practical, which I'd love to show you tonight. Now, how I'm going to do that is I'm going to quickly run through 10 points from the story and how that matches up to what Jesus has done for us. Now, remember at the start, I said that we need to know who we are and what Jesus has done, and then we can live in light of that. So I've got a table here, I love tables, which we'll fill in as we go, okay? I'll have the Philemon story column on the left and us on the right uh, to hopefully make it a bit easier for you guys to follow through. And we're going to see how Onesimus' redemption story matches up to our own. And after that, I'll lead into the implication from all of this. I know it sounds exciting, but stick with me. It'll be worth it, okay? So we'll work through the letter. First off... We have Onesimus, who is a slave who has run away from Philemon and now has realized that something is wrong. See, Onesimus had a relationship with Philemon, but then he did something that caused a fracture in that relationship. And so he's run away. And there's even some indication from the text that he might have stolen from Philemon as well. So a divide has been created by this bad action. Onesimus has sinned against or he's done something bad to Philemon. And the Bible says that we are like Onesimus when it comes to our relationship with God, that we've all run away from God, that we had a relationship with God, but it's been fractured. The book of Isaiah, who's one of the Old Testament prophets, says that we are all like sheep who have gone astray, with each of us turning to our, old, to our own way. Now, you might say, well, that's not true. I'm a pretty good person, and I'm in charge of my life. But a quick way to test that is try spending one day being perfect. Okay? We all know that we can't even live up to our own standards. And look outside into the world for one second, and you'll see something has gone wrong. And so that's the story of our lives, that we, like Onesimus, have run away from the one we're supposed to be with, expecting to find life, but instead we found the opposite. And so we can see already, I hope you're picking up already, that from this story, Onesimus can be used as a picture for who we are, Philemon can be a picture of who God the Father is, as the one who's been sinned against. And Paul, as the mediator between the two, can be a really good picture of who Jesus Christ is, as we'll continue to flesh out through the message. Now, secondly, what we need to know that in the Roman world, the punishment for a slave running away was death. So Philemon was well within his rights to have Onesimus executed. Onesimus deserved death. In fact, it would have been an extraordinary act for Philemon not to do that. And the Bible says the same about us as well, that in Romans 3.23, that all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then Romans 6.23 says that because of this, a debt is owed, and the price or the wage of that debt is death. That the deserved punishment for our sin is death, or eternal separation from God. And this is because God is not only loving, but he's also holy and just. Like, he can't just sweep the bad stuff under the carpet. In the same way that if somebody did something bad to you and you had to take them to court, you wouldn't say that the judge is a loving judge if he just swept it under the carpet and did nothing about it. God doesn't owe us anything. In fact, what we should receive is death, just like Onesimus deserves in this situation. Now, thirdly, we see that Paul is the perfect mediator between Philemon and Onesimus. Like, Onesimus can't just go straight back to Philemon and pretend that nothing happened, that there's no bad blood, okay? He needs someone to intercede or to mediate on his behalf, to be the middleman for him. 
And we see that Paul is probably the only one who could make this request to Philemon on Onesimus' behalf because Paul already has a strong existing relationship with Philemon. So what does he say in verse 19? Not to mention that you owe me your very self. I always found that funny, not to mention, and then he does mention it. But anyway, so that indicates that Paul was the one who actually introduced Philemon to Christ. And Paul was also the one who loved Onesimus enough that he would want to appeal for him. Okay, verse 10 says that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. And verse 12 that says that Paul views Onesimus as his very heart. See, Paul is the perfect mediator between the two because he is loved deeply by both and he deeply loves both. And in the same way, we need a perfect mediator between us and God. And Jesus is this. See, God sent Jesus into the world, fully human and fully God, to bridge the gap that was created by our sin. And Jesus is the perfect middleman between us and God because Jesus is the one with the perfect love for God and the perfect love for us all and therefore is the one who can perfectly reconcile us to God. Fourthly, we have Paul offering to pay the debt that Onesimus owes to Philemon. Let's look at verse 18 and the first half of verse 19. Paul says, If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Paul is saying that he will willingly take on the cost of Onesimus' betrayal himself. And this is incredible. This is a perfect picture of what Jesus Christ did for us. And this is the gospel, that Christ pays the debt that we owe to God for our sin to bring us back into a relationship with him by dying on the cross and wiping clear the debt that we had against us. There's a book in the Bible called Colossians, and this is chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. This is the message translation. When you were stuck in your old dead sin life, uh, sin dead life, you were incapable of responding to God. But God brought you alive, right along with Christ. Think of it, all sins forgiven, the slate wiped clean. That old arrest warrant cancelled and nailed to Christ's cross. See, Jesus didn't just offer to pay the debt like Paul is doing for Onesimus. He actually paid for it. Jesus Christ paid our debt. He removed the barrier between us and God. In fact, Jesus went even further. See, the way for Paul to truly do what Jesus has done is for him to not offer to pay the debt, but to actually take Onesimus' place. And that's what Jesus did for us. You guys with me still? I love this stuff. I hope you do too. Anyway, number five, Onesimus is reconciled to Philemon because of his union to Paul. In verse 17, he says, So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. Paul is saying that the way that you would deal with me if you saw me, that's how I want you to treat Onesimus. Because Onesimus is joined to me, the way you treat me is how you should treat him. And this is the video that we showed during the announcement time. That because of our union to Jesus, when we believe in him, God accepts us in the same way that he would accept his son. Because the sacrifice of Jesus, we become one with him so that when God looks at us, he doesn't see us, he sees his son. 2 Corinthians 5.21 puts it this way, that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, Jesus, who lived the perfect life, switched places with us so that he got our sin and we got his perfect life in what Martin Luther, for all you Luther kids here, calls the great exchange. If you put your faith in Christ, then your sin is paid for by Jesus and therefore God is going to accept you as his perfect child. He's going to see you as he would see Jesus. Number six, not only is Onesimus forgiven, but to be forgiven, he is to be adopted into the family of Philemon. In verse 16, Paul says, except you no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. As a brother, so family language there. And it's the same with us. When we put our faith in Christ, we are no longer stuck as slaves, but we are adopted into the family of God. Romans 8.14 says, For those who are led by the Spirit are of God are children of God. And John says in his gospel, in chapter 1, verse 12, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. See, before we were slaves to sin, but Jesus Christ paid the price for our slavery, setting us free to become a part of God's family. So he doesn't just take us back as slaves. He takes us back as children, as family, and we're elevated because of him. 
Number seven, the driving force between the reconciliation of Onesimus and Philemon is not obligation but love. See, Paul says in verses 8 and 9, Therefore, although I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. And in verse 14 he says, I, But I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. And in the same way, God did not send Jesus into the world out of some feeling of obligation, but he chose to set his love on us. 1 John 4.10, it's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. And it says, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son in as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. See, God wants you because of who you are right now. Don't think, oh, well, he loves me because he has to in the same way that we sometimes think that our parents love us. Okay? It's not like that at all. See, God was not obligated to fix our relationship with him. He didn't have to send Jesus into the world, but he chose to set his love on us. He did it because he loves us. Number eight, the relationship between Onesimus and Philemon is now much more eternal and secure. In verse 15, Paul says, Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. See, now in this new relationship as a brother, Philemon doesn't just have him for a little while, but he has him for forever. See, Onesimus as a slave and as a non-Christian, that was a relationship that was going to end. But Onesimus as a brother and as a Christian, that's an eternal relationship. And it's the same with us, that because of Jesus, our relationship to God is now much more eternal and secure. Paul tells us at the end of uh, Romans chapter 8 that uh, now that we are a child of God, no height nor depth, nor any power in all the world can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. See, our relationship with God is eternal and secure because of what Jesus has done for us. Two to go. God was sovereign over the situation with Philemon and Onesimus. So the same verse, verse 15. Paul is guessing that the reason that Onesimus was parted for a little while was so that he could have him back forever. He's saying that, yes, Onesimus was wrong to run away. Like, he's not sweeping that under the carpet in any way. But God was sovereign over the situation, and he led him to me so that he could become a Christian. And now you'll have a much deeper relationship with him. And this is very similar to the story of Joseph from the book of Genesis, if you know your Bible well. He gets sold into slavery by his brothers, and then he becomes the second most powerful person in all of Egypt. And he actually has to save his brothers later on. And they're really scared to talk to him. They're like, oh, we've done something bad against him. He's going to hate us. And what does he say? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. See, God was sovereign over that situation with Joseph, even when it seemed bad. And he's sovereign over this situation with Onesimus, even though it seemed bad. And he's sovereign over the death of Jesus, even though that was bad. And he's sovereign over all the situations in our lives, even when they seem bad. See, God is not an ambulance driver. He's not like surprised and reacting to a situation like, ah, what just happened then? Okay, God knows what's going to happen. What happened to Jesus on the cross didn't surprise God. It was part of his plan to fix the broken relationship that we had with him and existed, which should set us free from feeling like we need to be perfect all the time because God has outed us on the cross. Like we don't need to pretend that we're perfect because the cross of Jesus Christ proves that we're not. In fact, the Bible tells us in 1 John that if we pretend that we are perfect and that we have no sin, that there's nothing wrong with us at all, then we're only lying to ourselves. See, God knows that you're going to mess up. God knows that I'm going to mess up. God knows that you and I have messed up, and he loves us anyway, and he's sovereign over it all. So finally, number 10. Paul knows that because of his relationship with Jesus, Philemon will do even more than is expected. In verse 21, Paul writes to Philemon, Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. See, Paul is saying that because of Philemon's love for Christ, he knows that Philemon will exceed the minimum requirement of what he's asking him to do. And I'm trying to show you what's on offer tonight. Okay? This is the implication of what Jesus has done for us all. That the gospel gives us the ability to live a life that exceeds the life we could have lived beforehand. Now, I'm not standing up here saying that I've got it all figured out and that I'm perfect because I'm far from that. But what I am is forgiven. Okay? 
when I had no right to be, and that's the best news I'm ever going to receive. And that news can be true for you as well, that when God sees you, he sees his son. He treats you and receives you as he would his son. And that's a perfect, secure relationship that you can never lose. And so because of this, we, like Philemon, will be able to do more than can be expected. See, the gospel gives us a new standard, not what is the minimum requirement, but how can I do even more? See, the Christian standard isn't just what is fair, but what is love. Not just what is the minimum requirement, but how can I blow away the minimum requirement with love? See, there's this story in the Bible. Okay, Peter, one of the apostles, asked Jesus one day, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? So what he's saying to Jesus is, look, there's bad blood, and I know that I should forgive, so what is the minimum requirement? But then he tries to sound really forgiving by saying seven times, because in the Jewish culture back then, to be really forgiving would be to forgive someone three times. So he's saying, look, I know I should forgive, and I'm following you, so I know I should do a bit more anyways. I know I should be, go, be going above the minimum requirement. Is this enough? But how does Jesus respond? He completely blows away the minimum requirement. He says not seven times, but 77 times. And even that's not an exact number. See, Jesus is confident that through him, Peter will be able to do even more than even he thinks. And it's the same with us. Because of God, we don't just do what is expected, but we can go beyond that. So if we go back to the start, the letter of Philemon, Paul says in verse 7, that your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of, God, of the Lord's people, so of other Christians. And Paul is saying that he has gotten so much happiness from the way in which Philemon has been treating other Christians. But then he asks him to go beyond that and show that same love to someone who has wronged him. He's saying the bar has been raised. He's not just saying bring Onesimus back to a neutral state, just bring him back to him a slave him back as a slave, but I want you to bring him back as a brother. And that same, call, that same call is for us as well. But like I said at the start, look, this might be something that we all want to do but find really tough. But thankfully, God not only raises the standard, but he gives us the means to meet that standard. See, when you put your faith in Jesus, you become one with him. And so his righteousness becomes yours. Remember, we talked about that great exchange at the start. Okay, so you, he gives you the power to live the way that he lived. So we can see that the way to be more forgiving and love those who you find difficult is to, uh, to love is to get closer to the one who showed us how to truly forgive and to truly love as he hung on the cross. The way I like to think about it is, say for example, if you want to get warm, okay, the way you get warm is you get closer to the fire. Or if you want to get wet, the way you get wet is you jump in the water. You have to get closer to it. In the same way, if you want to be able to truly love and truly forgive those people in your lives, then you need to get close, closer to the one who is the definition of truly loving and truly forgiving. And I think the people in this story give a great example of this for us. So who was Paul? Okay, Paul was the terrorist killing Christians. Think like Osama bin Laden. And then what happened? He became the greatest missionary the Christian world has ever seen. Now imagine what it would have taken for Osama bin Laden to become the world's greatest Christian ministry, missionary. And it wasn't someone telling Paul, you be more loving and you be more forgiving. No, what happened was he met Christ and then he became more loving. He drew closer to Christ and then he became more forgiving. And who was Philemon? Okay, Philemon was likely this rich guy. He has a large enough house for the church and his servants. But Paul appeals to him not out of obligation but out of love for Jesus. See, the only way that Paul can be confident in his request to Philemon is because of the transformed way that he has seen Philemon loving others because he has first been loved by God. So do you really think that like Paul would have been confident to make this request to Philemon if Philemon hadn't experienced the love of God in his own life first? And who was Onesimus? Onesimus was the guy who thought that life would be best if he took life into his own hands and then got into lots of trouble. But then what happened? He met Paul, and through Paul was introduced to the most wonderful, powerful, forgiving love of Jesus Christ. And what happened after this? Well, questions often asked of this text, like, what actually happened to Onesimus? Like, was he forgiven by Philemon? And we can't know for certain, but I think there's two good reasons as to why I think he might have been. First off, I don't think we would have this letter if Philemon hadn't forgiven him. 
Like, I reckon if Philemon had received this letter and he's gone, nah, he would have thrown it straight in the fire. Okay, so I think the fact that we have this still is a good indication that he actually did it. And second, and I think this is probably my favorite part, probably the biggest church for the early Christians was a church called Ephesus. Okay, Paul writes a letter to them. It's called the letter to the Ephesians. And they mention that the first of the seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation. And so when they were setting up leadership at the Ephesus church, they'd go for the big guns, so the top Christians, if you will. And the first bishop or the first leader of Ephesus was this guy called Timothy, okay, who was like Paul's apprentice or his Padawan or whatever you want to call him. And we have a couple of letters written from Paul to Timothy in the Bible. He was obviously a big deal. But then when Timothy moved on, according to history, who was ordained as the second bishop of Ephesus? A guy called Onesimus. Like, isn't that incredible that this guy who thought that by taking his life into his own hands, he was doing the best thing that he could possibly do. Well, God had bigger and better plans for him. So can you see the power in the gospel for the transformation of relationships? Like, Can you see the power in Philemon being able to forgive Onesimus because he was first forgiven by Christ? You see, Philemon's forgiveness of Onesimus had consequences that even he wouldn't have been able to see. Now, we all know who Martin Luther King Jr. was. He was the I have a dream guy. So that's a picture of him there. But he was a preacher. Like, I don't know if you guys know, he was a preacher. And his relationship with Jesus Christ is what drove him and determined his philosophy around life. And I reckon if anybody had any good reason not to want to forgive others, then he'd be pretty up there. But Jesus drove his life. And he was often asked why he wouldn't fight back, like why he wouldn't hate back, why he wouldn't hold bad blood against those people who were hurting him, like lynching his friends and things like that. And here's a quote that he said, which I think highlights why it's important to forgive. He said, Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So where does that leave us? Kendrick Lamar said, you forgive, you forget, but you never let it go. And I reckon that without Jesus, that's true. But with him, you can start to transform all the relationships in your lives to be more loving than you ever thought possible. So I don't want you to leave this message thinking, well, I need to be more forgiving, because we all do. But we also need to know that by ourselves, we can't do it. But there was one who could. The light of the world who drove out the darkness. And Jesus Christ was able to forgive all of us when we didn't deserve it. He was able to hang from a cross and yell, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And we can see the transformed way in which Paul, in which Philemon, and which Onesimus were able to live their lives because of them experiencing the forgiving love of Jesus Christ. And through faith in Christ, we can live like that too. So let's pray. Holy God, you are good, and you are victorious over all things. You sent Jesus into the world, the one who is the true definition of love. So let us lean into you. Let us get to know you better so that we can love the same way that you let you loved, and so we can forgive the same way that you forgave us. Thank you. Amen.